This episode of Startup is brought to you by Open for Business, the branded podcast from eBay and Gimlet Creative. It can be hard to feel connected when your business isn't located in a big city. New York City, LA, Miami, they get all the attention, but they don't have what your town has, your community that knows you and your distinct local style. Before you move to the big city with your big idea, listen to episode five of Open for Business. Embrace the place. You might just find that your unfair advantage is right outside your front door. Open for Business gives you real practical lessons to help you grow your business, regardless of where you live. Check out Open for Business on Apple Podcasts or learn more at ebay.com slash open for business. And stay tuned after the show to hear the trailer. Before we start the show, we wanted to tell you about another show you might like. It's called Masters of Scale. You may have heard LinkedIn founder Reid Hoffman earlier in this season of Startup in our series about the rise and fall of Friendster. Masters of Scale is Reid's new podcast, where he talks to famous founders about what happens as companies grow from zero to a gazillion. Reid talks to founders like Mark Zuckerberg of Facebook and Sarah Blakely of Spanx, Their stories are always honest and often funny. There's no jargon and no posturing. You can subscribe to Masters of Scale and Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or wherever you love to listen. From Gimlet Media, I'm Lisa Chow. This is Startup, the show about what it's really like to start a business. On this episode, we're going to hear a conversation between a founder and an executive coach. What would feel comfortable talking about and useful? Yeah. Because that's the key. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think the biggest thing is, for me personally, um, you know, (laughs) I'm like getting teary even talking about it. I find it very challenging to navigate being a mom and being an entrepreneur and, you know, really feeling so um, really guilty about missing out on so much stuff at home. Um, and then when I do, you know, leave work about all the things I've left undone. So that, although it's very personal and very vulnerable, you know, feels like something it would be super helpful to address. This is Diana Lovett. She started a company called Cisse Coco, which makes baking mixes, hot chocolate, and other cocoa products. She's talking to Jerry Colonna, who will be familiar to longtime listeners. He was the CEO Whisper from season two. He's also the executive coach to Gimlet's founders, Alex and Matt. He used to be a venture capitalist and has a lot of experience working with entrepreneurs. A few weeks ago, we did a call out to our listeners. We were looking for entrepreneurs facing some kind of problem connected to their business. And that's how we met Diana. She started her career working for international NGOs, but she got disillusioned after seeing donors' priorities shift. So she began thinking about other ways to have a positive impact. She wondered, what if I took this thing that I love, chocolate, and built a business on it that supports small growers around the world? Our cocoa is grown in the Dominican Republic. It's grown by a cooperative called Fundapo, and they've put in some clean drinking water wells, they've renovated schools, they've built a community center, and that model really appealed to me. Uh, It was locally needs-driven. Cisse Coco is growing. Diana's products are on shelves in more than 4,000 stores, including at Whole Foods, Target, and Stop and Shop. She has visions of building out a brand as recognizable as Annie's Organic. But the thing that she struggles with most, day to day, is balancing being a CEO and being a parent to two young kids. And so when Diana sat down with Jerry, the executive coach, that's what they talked about. It's a conversation that a lot of working parents will probably relate to. I know I did. Diana's session with Jerry lasted an hour and a half. We're going to play a shortened version of their conversation. I mean, it feels kind of relentless. and You know what I mean? Like, from the minute I wake up in the morning, I'm baking brownies for a meeting, trying to have a little bit of time to connect with my kids, running off to work. You know, like, I get home, we make dinner. Like, it, I don't have a place to be calm and present until like 9.30 p.m. and then I'm exhausted. I feel like I can get hacks from other people. You know what I mean? I feel like I can get like advice. But the like how I face this as a person is so hard. Yeah. So we're going to be calm and present. (laughs) Okay. 
And we may or may not end up with a life hack or two. Okay. <laughs> but life hacking doesn't really get us the answers. Yeah. No, I feel like it's like emotion hacking or something so that you're, you it's, know. It's hacking being human. Yeah. So I have a couple of questions just to help give some context to this. Yeah. How old is the company? It's five and a half years old. And tell me, um, you're married? Yep. I have a husband. And what's his first name? Matt. Matt. And um, how long have you been together? We've been married for seven years. And how old are your children? Basically five and two. Like five. They're about to have birthdays. Gotcha. So, yeah. And what are their names? Noam and Tali. Boy and a girl. And Noam is the older. older. Yep. So both of them have only known mom as an entrepreneur. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that landed for you just now. Yeah. What's up? <laughs> I mean, it's a lot of guilt. You know, I didn't take a maternity leave with either of my kids. And I feel like that sort of, uh, I don't know, paradigm or example of, like, I feel like I've prioritized work over my kids. Slow and they've never... <laughs> when I and, tell you to do that, it's not that you've done something wrong. It's because our impulse when we touch really painful stuff is to speed through it. But it's like hitting a speed bump and speeding up for it. All that's going to happen is we're going to wreck the undercarriage of the car. <laughs> So we actually want to go slow over those tough spots. You feel like you have prioritized work over your children. Yep. Oh, that's a big statement. Yep. And I'm staring into your eyes and I'm seeing someone who can't believe she just said that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Cognitively, I know that they're deriving benefit from seeing me, you know, chase my dreams and be in power. Bad. Exactly, exactly, <laughs> exactly, exactly, yeah. So, but emotionally, yeah, it feels like crap. Yeah, no, I feel, t I mean, you know, my son, no one asked me this morning, Mama, can you take me to the aquarium today? And I was like, well, that's a good question. You know, I said, well, I can take you over the weekend. And he was like, well, I want to go with you today. Right. So, right. you know, that was 7.15 this morning. Right. And, you know, like, he's really happy. He's well-adjusted. You know, he's great. So I don't think he's living in a world of deprivation. But I am missing that. Mm -hmm. And I think it elevates my stress level at work because... I try and be home for family dinner, so I have that, you know, internal cutoff, like I have to be there at 7. So I feel like it's, like, sort of negative at home because I'm not there enough. And then and when I am in negative work because I'm so aggressive, I'm like, no, I can't take that on too. You know what I mean? Like, it, I feel like it's putting all sorts of yeah. boxes around it that's making it harder everywhere. Yeah. So that's what— So you feel like you're failing on both ends. Yeah. I don't think, it, I don't think it's helpful. Yeah. Boy, howdy, you've got a lot of guilt. You feel guilty because you're not a good enough leader? Yeah, yeah. And you feel guilty because you're not a good enough mother? Yeah. You know, for me, it's the, it's the time. I just, I don't know how you're supposed to, you know, spend every minute with your kids and spend every minute at work. Where did you get the impression that you're supposed to spend every minute with the kids or at work? Yeah, that's a good question. I'm not, I don't want to have, you know, I wouldn't want to have no profession. But I think the, you know, the challenge for me is just making more time. Making more time. Or making better time. I don't know, you know, I don't know what the answer is. Or, you know, making better time. You know, just like getting into that mental space where I feel happy and present at home and I feel happy and present at work. Oh, and I'm not, sorry. you know, yeah. feeling 
tethered or guilty about the other one when I'm not, you know what I mean? Just yes. like if I, like I, I do this when I get home from work, I zip my phone into my backpack and I hang it in our mudroom. So it's nicely done. It's like not present, you know, yes. so that this family dinner and putting the kids to bed is separate from that. Yes. But even during that time, you know, if you have a bad day, it's sort of this like dour cloud, you know, it affects you. I can't, I can't zip the way I feel about work into my bag. It's I may not be checking my email or, you know, transacting business at the dinner table, but sometimes it's occupying my attention even when I'm sitting with my family. Okay. So let's yeah. stay with this. So yeah. I love your I'm gonna zip my phone into yeah. my bag, but that's a hack. Right. And what you notice is it actually doesn't alleviate the anxiety that you're carrying from work. And so then you're feeling, this is what you're doing. Yep. You're feeling guilty because you're feeling anxious. Yeah. And then you're feeling anxious because you're feeling guilty. Yeah. And the only question, the only choices that you seem to be holding on to is make more time or make better use of the time that I have. Yeah. How about not feeling guilty? I know. How? (laughs) I want to read you something. Okay. And um, one of my teachers is a Buddhist teacher named Sharon Salzberg. And this is from a book she's written called Loving Kindness. Buddhist psychology makes an interesting distinction between guilt and remorse. The feeling of guilt or hatred directed towards oneself, lacerates. When we experience a strong feeling of guilt in the mind, we have little or no energy available for transformation or transcendence. We are defeated by the guilt itself because it depletes us. We also feel very alone. Our thoughts focus on our worthlessness. I'm the worst person in the world. Only I do terrible things. However, such an attitude is actually very, quote, self-promoting. We become obsessed with self in the egotistical sense. Remorse, by contrast, is a state of recognition. We realize that we have at some point done something or said something unskillful that caused pain, and we feel the pain of recognition. But crucially, remorse frees us to let go of the past. It leaves us with some energy to move on. Now, it's a long quote, but it's an important quote, I think, for you to work with. Because I get moving back and forth between feeling like you're doing a crappy job at the office and a crappy job at home. And you're too sophisticated to fall into the trap of thinking you're supposed to have it perfectly figured out, aren't you? Right. Thinking about your children for a moment, what what do you believe about the world that you would like them to know? What value would you like them to have? Yeah, I mean, I think I I want them to be conscious. Uh-huh. I empathetic. Perhaps? I want them to be empathetic. I want them to have a sense of empowerment that when they see an injustice that they're empowered to be change makers. What if they fail? I would be proud of them for trying. Yeah. What creates the pride in trying even if you fail? I mean, it's better than doing nothing, you know, or so I did this human rights fellowship after I graduated from college and we used the Holocaust as a framework for understanding contemporary issues of human rights. And in that framework, there was people who were bystanders, there was people who were collaborators, and then there were people who were part of the resistance. And I I want them to be part of the resistance. So is it possible that if they hold the understanding that mom was part of the resistance, yeah, 
and that sometimes we couldn't go to the aquarium, but she loved us nonetheless. I think so, but I don't know so, you know, and I think even well-intentioned parents can do things that, you know, affect children later in life in different ways. And maybe I inspired them to be part of the resistance, but all they wanted was for me to be at their lacrosse game, you know? And that's like, that's my little agenda. That that may not have been their little agenda. Well, that's the self-laceration. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Coming up... How do you stop self-laceration and express remorse to a five-year-old? And what exactly does it mean to be a good parent? That's after the break. This episode of Startup is brought to you by Blue Apron. Blue Apron provides meal kits filled with fresh ingredients that help you make easy, affordable meals. Not all ingredients are created equal, as we learned when we took a peek inside Gimlet's fridge. Okay, so our mission is to look for fresh ingredients in the Gimlet fridge. Okay, so what do we see in here? There are some dressings, and there's a lot of peanut butters back there. Almond butter, if they're like one, two, three, four, five, six. Six peanut butters and seven, seven peanut butters. There is a quarter of a red onion in a little Tupperware. I mean, I guess you could call it, you could say this is fresh, I guess. That's not fresh. For less than 10 bucks a serving, Blue Apron delivers pre-portioned ingredients to help you make actual fresh meals and prevent waste. So you don't wind up with seven half-used jars of peanut butter. Check out this week's menu with dishes like crispy salmon with roasted potato salad and get your first three meals for free with free shipping. Go to blueapron.com slash startup. This episode of Startup is brought to you by SoFi. SoFi is a new kind of finance company that aims to empower you to reach your goals on your own terms. Take student loans, for example. When you first take out your loans, you might get them from different lenders, private and federal, at different rates. Those rates can be high, and they don't take into account the good credit that you might be building as you get a job after school and move on with your life. SoFi can refinance those student loans. They consolidate all your loans into one new loan at a lower interest rate. According to their statistics, this saves their members $22,359 on average. But SoFi is more than a lender. It's a community. SoFi offers its members workshops, happy hours, and one-on-one career coaching, so you can confidently build your career with an expert at your side. To find out if refinancing your student loans with SoFi is right for you, visit SoFi.com. That's S-O-F-I dot com. Terms and conditions apply. See SoFi.com slash legal. Loans originated by SoFi Lending Corporation and may not be available in all states. CFL number 6054612, NMLS number 1121636. Welcome back to Startup. When we left off, Diana was talking to Jerry about the conflict she feels, wanting to do the work that she's passionate about, but also wanting to be there for her kids. Jerry continued the session by asking her about her expectations for herself. Can you forgive yourself for leaving the home in the morning? Yes. Can you forgive yourself for leaving work? Yes. Can you forgive yourself for not taking your son to the aquarium today? (laughs) No. If the shoe were on the other foot, could you forgive Noam for disappointing you? Yes. So you're holding yourself to a standard that you don't hold anybody else that you love to. Yeah, but I think it's different for parents. What are parents supposed to do? I mean, they're supposed to be the people that are 
you know, unconditional love. They're supposed to nurture and support you. They're supposed to, you know, that's my framework, right? Like you're supposed to bring your own values and share those with your children. But then you're also supposed to be like, but who are these tiny creatures and how do they express, you know, and then be supportive of that. Okay, we took them to skating. They hated that. Let's do painting. You know what I mean? Like to constantly be taking the feedback of who they are and incorporating that into how you raise them and constantly kind of reading the tea leaves of their faces. I think they just need a hug, right? Now, you know what I mean? Like to intuit their their needs on all levels. And I think my friend... What, what is the skill set or the way of being that's most in service to them? There you are, reading the tea leaves of their eyes, trying to gauge, do they need a hug? Do they need a trip to the aquarium? Yeah. Do they need a mom that they can believe in as a leader of the resistance? What do they need? It's unconditional love. What would unconditional love give them about themselves? Self-empowerment. Yeah. So when you spend all this energy trying to anticipate and meet their needs... How does that help their self-empowerment? Look, I'm going to respond to you, not even as a coach, but as a fellow parent. Only my children are adults now. I lacerated myself in the same ways. Yeah. So I really relate to where you're coming from. And the one salvation for me was the realization that stumbling our way through, we gave our children the ability to speak, to say, this is what I need from you. Sometimes modeling for them what it means to be a participant in a larger, more conscious world. Yeah. My therapist once gave me a really powerful piece of parenting advice. You are going to screw it up. Get used to that. The issue is not how do I prevent that, but how do I instill in my children the resiliency so that they can grow into their own adulthood? But why? Why do we have to accept that we're going to screw it up? Because we are imperfect beings. Yeah. And because learning to actually be with our imperfections as parents, perhaps, is their most important lesson. Do they love you regardless of your imperfections? Yes. That's a powerful, powerful lesson. Can they be loved despite their imperfections? Yes. Would you love them nonetheless, no matter what? Yes. That's the lesson. Yeah. Teach them how to speak that they felt disappointed. Teach them how to think about responding to somebody Knowing that unconditionally, no matter what they say, they will be met with love. And to say, Mom, I was mad that you didn't come to the game. Yeah. That hurts, but it's a powerful lesson. Yeah. From where I sit, I think that's as important, if not more important, than actually you being at the game. Learning at an early age... I am okay whether or not mom's at the game. Sure, I want mom at the game. Yeah. But I am not annihilated and devastated because mom's not at the game. Because I know mom loves me. Yeah. And when I tell her that I'm mad, she's still going to love me. Yeah. Yeah. That's a pretty powerful gift. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, maybe it's hard because they can't articulate that right now. You know what I mean? That's right. They're so so little that they're not really, that's why I think it's like reading the tea leaves. You know, your kids are older so they can tell you you're upset about it. I'm like, I think my five-year-old kind of can because he's like, I want you to come to the aquarium. And then I'm like, I can't because I have to work. But then if I tried to say, you know, and how does that make you feel? He'd be like, okay. No, but you might say, (laughs) but you might model. Yeah. And that makes me feel sad. No. Yeah. And so I want to spend time with you. And sometimes I can. Yeah. And sometimes I can't. And that makes me feel sad. 
That makes me feel sad too, Mommy. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? What, what you're reaching for is presence. Where I think you're, if I may, where yeah. I think you're still getting tripped up is a kind of hacking. That the yeah. only way to meet Gnome's need in that moment was to actually go to the aquarium. Yeah. Yeah. That's Which an impossibility. Like, right. Right. So here's the kind of leadership assignment yeah. slash growth assignment. Yeah. You made the connection before to your own company. Yeah. Leaning into these spots, learning how to be with these conflictual feelings is really important for the company. Yeah. It's really important for your own resiliency. Yeah. And it's really important lesson to model for those kids. Yeah. Because they're going to face the same kind of conflicts in life. Yeah. They're going to be torn. Yeah. They're going to want to be in one place and the other. What you can give them, which very few other people in their world will be able to give them, is modeling a way to be with those conflicts. Not with guilt that lacerates, but, yeah, I'm sorry I missed that. And I'm going to let it go. And I'm going to look forward to the thing that we are doing together. That would be amazing to give them. <laughs> Imagine they enter their 30s and 40s with that kind of a perspective. They enter their parenting with that kind of perspective. That makes a lot of sense. I mean, to give them that, I think especially my daughter, because I, I do think it's more powerful for women. But I think it is intensely powerful. It is a torture for women. Yeah. That concept of, you know, of no guilt or whatever else, like... I do think that that's a pretty powerful thing for myself, for them, and I'll, probably for my other colleagues who are parents. Let me check in. Tell me how you're feeling. Yeah, I mean, I think the part that's really, like, connecting for me is, you know, saying it. So instead of just being like, oh, I wasn't here, I didn't make it to the aquarium, is being able to say, you know, I'm sad we didn't get to go together. We could go together on the weekend or, you know, whatever else. I think the the point that I'm I think is gonna be harder for me is to act you know, I can verbalize the remorse, you know, but actually just shutting down that you know, stopping that yeah. and redirecting it, that feels harder. So a word about that. Learn some slow time. As you're putting the kids to bed tonight, look into their eyes. Don't just put the phone in the, in the bag. Look into their eyes. Here's a memory. You know what they smell like after they've taken a bath? So good. So good. You know what they what they feel like when they snuggle you and they have their pajamas on and they're getting ready for bed and, Mommy, will you read a book to me? Yeah. Okay. Those are the precious slow times. Those are the times. Ah, uh, watch the laceration. It just came back in. <laughs> I know. I feel like I've been rushing through it, you know? Yeah. I'm like, oh, let's get the kids to bed so we can clean up. So, like, because it it's so compressed, you yeah. know? But I'm with you. I mean, that is the good, you know? That's not one more thing. That is the thing. Yes. When the session between Diana and Jerry ended, Diana took the train back home to where she lives, outside of New York City. I caught up with her a couple of weeks later. This is Diana. Hi, Diana. It's Lisa. Hi, Lisa. How are you? Good. How are you? I'm good. Okay. Talking to Diana, I wanted to know how things had been since our meeting with Jerry. My kids are about the same age as Diana's, and when she talked about her guilt, I understood where she was coming from. You know, hearing your conversation, uh, you know, it was very, it was actually, it was, it was, 
<laughs> living vicariously through you. Um, but it was very helpful. Yeah. Um, because, I mean, just hearing your guilt, uh, I think a lot of moms experience that level of guilt. I totally. certainly do. And hearing Jerry talk to you about that guilt um, was interesting to kind of hear him challenge you a little bit on it. Yeah. So I'm curious, like, in the last couple of weeks, has there been an instance where you caught yourself feeling guilt again? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, it's um, impossible to, you know, flick that on and off. So right. absolutely. Um, you know, my son was like, Mama, I don't want you to go to work today. In that moment, Diana borrowed some of Jerry's language from the session. And what did you, how did you respond to Noam when he asked you that? I would say, I want to stay home with you, too. I'm so sad I'm going to miss spending all day with you. Um, I'm going to go to work, and I'm working on building something that's about, you know, doing good and helping other people. And I'm really passionate about it. And, um, and say, you know what, I'm sad I'm not going to be here with you. Right, right. Before, how would you talk to Noam about about leaving. Yeah. Um, I guess I would say, you know, oh, don't worry. You know, I'll be home for dinner and, you know, we'll be together on the weekend or, you know, kind of maybe more dismissive or distraction. Right. And acknowledgement. And how did Noam respond? I mean, you know, he was like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> He's five. So he was like, oh, is that a bouncy ball? Um, so it was not like a big profound moment. Diana says she's leaning on Jerry's advice in other ways, too, being gentler on herself and experiencing the slow times. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to sit at the table with my coffee. You know, they're eating breakfast. You know, when you really lock eyes with your, with your little ones and you're connecting, you're making them laugh or whatever else. It's like, what are you rushing through whatever time you are spending with them? Like, what are you going to put them down? And then you're going to like, clean the dishes and do more work like that kind of stinks so you know why not really enjoy it right right it didn't cause any anxiety about not getting those things done in your to-do list <laughs> I mean now that you're mentioning it yes but at the time no thanks a lot Lisa <laughs> sorry <laughs> Diana is still looking for new hacks like trying to include her kids when there's downtime at work a few weeks back, her company got a delivery in, and she invited Noam and Tali to the office to hang out while she unloaded pallets. She's also planning to take Noam along the next time she demos her company's products. But learning how to go easy on herself, that's going to take time. It's probably like a 16-point turn and not a U-turn. <laughs> right, right. You know, it's hard not to feel guilty about missing out on time with your kids. You know, oh, what did you do today? Oh, I went to swimming and, you know, I got a badge and I'm a slime eel now. And, you know, you're just like, I want to be there. I want to see you get your little badge. That's it's always a challenge, right? Diana Lovett is the founder of Cisse Coco, a company that makes chocolate products. The executive coach she talked to, Jerry Colonna, has his own podcast called Reboot. If you're an entrepreneur who's facing a challenge in your company and would like to talk about it on Startup with a coach, email us at startup at gimletmedia.com with the subject line coaching. Tell us about the problem you're struggling with and how best to reach you. Next time on Startup, a founder who's trying to revolutionize medicine gets some unexpected lessons. I had to like learn a bunch of stuff about pigs because I, I knew nothing about pigs. <laughs> so I was looking at like people who have pigs as pets. They have these lists of things to do with the pigs. They're real smart and they'll get bored if you don't give them toys. They get sunburned easily, things like that. The lengths you'll go to to follow a dream. That's next week on Startup. Startup is hosted by me, Lisa Chow. Our show is produced by Bruce Wallace, Luke Malone, Simone Polanin, and Emmanuel Berry. Our senior producer is Molly Messick. We are edited by Caitlin Kenny and Pat Walters. Production assistance and fact-checking by Alvin Melleth. Mark Phillips wrote and performed our theme song. Build Buildings wrote and performed our special ad music. Additional music by Bobby Lord. David Herman mixed the episode. 
To subscribe to Startup, go to Apple Podcasts or whichever app you like to use. Or check out the Gimlet Media website, gimletmedia.com. You can follow us on Twitter at Podcast Startup. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next week. Thanks to our sponsor, Blue Apron. Blue Apron believes that not all ingredients are created equal. Check out the fresh ingredients on this week's menu and get your first three meals for free with free shipping by going to blueapron.com slash startup. Hey, listeners, here's the trailer for Open for Business, the branded podcast from eBay and Gimlet Creative that I mentioned at the top of the show. And if you want more, subscribe at Apple Podcasts or anywhere else you listen. Did you feel like it was moving too fast when you started? I mean, the truth is, like, I felt like it was moving too fast and it was moving too fast. I'm John Henry, and this is Open for Business a branded podcast from eBay and Gimlet Creative about building a business from the ground up. We're back for season two. It's easy to give good customer service when everything's going right, but your customer service strategy isn't tested until you actually have a buyer that has an issue. I don't want to say this out loud, but I'm really glad that I got a competitor. Oh, God, I just said that out loud. I don't like it, but... It's made me a better entrepreneur. I have X amount of dollars in the stock market. I'm betting on these other companies. Like, why am I so scared to put this money on myself? You can listen to season two of Open for Business on iTunes or Google Play.